What a day we live in. Good be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Can you know I've been reading in Numbers lately, right? And so one of the things that I, uh, that amazes me as they take the sacrifice is they God has these priests take some of the shoulder and some of the things, and He says, "I want you to wave it before me as a wave offering." Ah, when I was reading, I was thinking about the Seahawk Stadium. Right? And they get up and they do their thing. The wave offering. Now, God's already got the sacrifice going. He's already told them what to do. But then He says, take the portion in which you're going to sacrifice and offer it as a wave offering. That's, that's exciting. Can you do a wave offering? Huh? So now, the portion of the wave offering is that in that uh, wave offering was a portion of the meat that was going to be sacrificed. In fact, after the wave offering, if I remember it right, you correct me if I'm wrong. That's good. I want you to. But then he says, after you offer the wave offering, you're to eat it. In fact, you're to eat it all before the next day. Think about that for a minute. So you just did a wave offering. What did you have in your hands that you were offering? So you got to digest what you just waved. you got to think about it and spiritually digest it and eat it and think about it for that wave offering, right? Hey, that's not the message. Amen? So we got some... I, I, anybody, what has happened in your life this week? Have you shared Jesus with anybody? Have you prayed for someone? Have you blessed someone this day, this last week? Anybody? Yes? I have a neighbor who's going through a hard time. Her son is mouthy, abused to her, a very foul mouth, and has been for a long, long time. But he took it up one more step. He started hitting her, and she's 75 years old. I know that lady. Yes, you do. Her name is Jerry. Yes. Yes. And she called the police, which surprised him. He, they came and took him away with handcuffs and put him in jail. She was hoping he would stay there for a little while, think about what had happened, but his girlfriend got him out. But then he had an uncle that came from Texas all the way, drove, and took all the guns out of her house. He had lots of guns, and he wasn't supposed to have any there. But anyway, he had his children, he has two kids, call Grandma after she'd gone to bed and say, Grandma, we hate you. We don't love you. We don't want to talk to you anymore. And so I had gone over to see her, and she said, Midge, I just want to die. I said, Jerry, you can't, not until the Lord's ready for you. I said, uh, and don't, don't try and do anything on your own. She says, I won't. She loves the Lord. She's a Christian. But I said, and then we had prayer. And uh, it just, it's been very hard for her. And I just, her name is Jerry, and it, the Lord brings her name to your mind, just if you would be the prayer for her. Catholic. So she needs to go and get blessed by the priest. Right? I mean, just go and say, hey, I need you to pray for me. Or we can lay hands on her and we can be the priest. Right? Because we have been given the priesthood. Did you realize that? So we can, by authority in Jesus' name, we can pray for Jerry right now. Father, we come in the name of Jesus Christ. When all of the world turns upside down and it seems like everyone you love is against you and you've tried nothing but to help them, mighty God, the devil, the accuser, the liar of the, of the brethren comes. But we pray that your Holy Spirit would surround her right now in a supernatural way, Father God, like she's never experienced before in the joy of the Lord and the peace because the Word of God says those who keep their mind on you, that their life will be full of peace, Father God. And we pray in the name of Jesus for Jerry. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. We pray for her son. Father God, we know that he's military. We know that he has PTSD, whatever that means. But you said that we can come against pestilence and disease and sickness. And we come against that right now. That you would give him clear mind, Father God. That he would humble himself before you. And he would confess his sin. And he would receive you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Amen. Can we say amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hey, Jesus is the only one that's going to make a difference in that situation. I can tell you what. He's already been to counseling from the Veterans Administration. He's already on, supposed to be on medication. I know a little bit about it. But let me tell you, just let me get a little political here. The man should not have guns. 
for all of us who have gun rights, and we believe in gun rights, that man should not have guns. Now, I know I've gone against somebody pretty hard here, but that man should not have guns. He is a danger to himself. He is a danger to other people around him. And he should not have guns until he's healed and delivered and he's been justifiably confirmed he's healed. Can we agree on that? So all of our people that we stand against, sometimes they're not always wrong. Oh, boy. Go ahead, Dale. Help me get out of this. Boy, did you open a box. I'm sorry. <laughs> But on, Take guns from people who are going to kill someone. Take them from them. And see, this, this is part of the situation that we see is that without Christ being on our life, without us drawing on the Holy Spirit, we run into these problems and we face them every day. Ron was talking about it today, about the issues that, that Paul faced. And we talked, I brought up the fact of a lot of our battles are actually flesh and spiritual. It's not just stuff that happens to us. Okay, now we have a situation with with Jerry, which it's a very it's a rough situation. It's a bad spot to be in. But on the positive side, we're going to flip. I'm going to flip this on you a little bit, too, that we also have reason to praise. We have we have to get down on our knees at time and we have to pray. But we also have to get down and raise our hands up and give praise. Like I had mentioned last Sunday, we took an off a love offering for a family and you're never going to guess what happened. Nope, we didn't. We didn't even come close. But what ended up happening is somebody else had stepped in without us knowing at the time. Somebody else helped that family out. So the Spirit moved on somebody. Whether they were a Christian or not, the Spirit moved on somebody. Okay? Okay. So this, the situation has been rectified, so there won't be a love offering taking. But this is how Christ works. This is how the Spirit works with us. Will Jerry receive satisfaction? Will she receive, will her son be saved? I don't know. But through prayers we can find out. God has a calling for all of us, and... It's only through him that we can answer that. Hey, so as you're speaking about Jerry, God said, hey, you know, why don't you just pray for Jerry to come here? That's true. I'm always a little reserved when it comes to that. I want you to invite him, and I don't want to look like I'm dogmatic about getting people to fill our pews. But, but the Lord said, why don't you pray? She knows me. I did her husband's memorial service, so we've had spiritual talk. See, he said, why don't you just ask me to send her there? Well, I'm wondering, do I really have to do that? Because you just told me, I mean, you're already going to do it anyway, right? Ah, oh, come on, guys. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Father, we'd love to be a memorial support for Jerry. We'd love to wrap our arms around her to love her. Um, we'd like to be a support group. We'd like her to uh, come and be with us. And, Lord, we believe that this is from you. So we ask, Lord, as Midge begins to share, and maybe this week I'll get down to talk to her, that we will invite her to come to be a fellowship with us. I know J Derry lives there too, and I know Randy visits there too. And so maybe the three of them could make a difference in Jerry's life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hey, uh, we're gonna, we got some uh, subjects we need to talk about, so I'm going to move along so we're not here until 1230. So. Oh, I want you to hold on to that. I want you to hold on to that. I've got to, I'm going to invite you to come up and share at an appropriate time. Because I want others to hear it. It's part of my message. Can you, can you hang on to that? Amen. All right. Do you have any questions of me? This is a good time. I won't answer any more questions from here on out. No, just kidding. Amen. Praise God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you where the Lord has me today. Right where He needs me. <laughs> yeah, supernaturally, uh, I am believing God for a spiritual revival in the heart of believers around the world. I'm spiritually believing that when all the unctions of the politicians and things that would like to corrupt our children with their sex education in the state of Washington, I'm believing God's going to move. 
I've had three teachers tell me this week that they're very concerned about what's happening for their own life. Three of them are believers. Uh, if you don't know that, talk to me afterwards. I'll show you what's happening. And uh, it's in going to come out of the committee and going to be voted on. And they will be take, teaching sex education in our kindergartens. Full sex education. So about everything, including nuns, which have no religious purpose. And they're the ones pressing. So what are we saying? I'm not saying, we, we, we're not going to go down there and take him over with the body. I'm saying let's pray as believers and let God pour out his Holy Spirit on all flesh. That's what I'm saying. Amen? Amen. I want you to tell the story. Right? This is a great story. Oh, two stories. Uh, you can do either one you want. Okay. Well, I'll do the other one first then. You know, just I just had surgery. Just This Tuesday will be three weeks on my shoulder. Uh, rotator cuff surgery again. Because the first one, I'd, uh, I had used it too soon apparently or something. And one of the uh, anchors came out of my bone in my shoulder. And so when he took the x-ray, he said, that's going to have to come out. We're going to have to start all over again. So when I went in last Thursday to have my stitches out from this last surgery that he just did two weeks ago, he uh, asked me how my shoulder was doing. I said, I, you know, it feels better than it did the first time you did it. And uh, I said, it's been feeling good. He said, that's good to know. He says, you know what? He said, I was really surprised. I got in there and your shoulder was 90% healed. <laughs> so... He said, I still had to take that metal anchor out that had slipped out of place. And he said, I just attached the tendon to the bone and then sewed it back up. And, and my arm has just felt so much better. I mean, I can just move it. But I have to wear this sling to remind me not to do too much on it yet. So, but... Um, I can do 90%, he can do the other 10, no problem. That's, Amen? That's right. right? But, I told, but I mentioned, I said, God was already healing me. Amen. So... But I'm, I'm just so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for your, for your prayers and all the food that was brought in and just everything. It's just been wonderful. But this was, he was asking about testimonies, if you'd bless somebody. Well, this was just before my surgery. Uh, the week before, Don and I was in Safeway. And we met this lady. Uh, she saw, saw us and she came up and she was... Um, she saw Don's vest, I guess, walking for cancer, and she said, you know, I thank God. She said, I'm 83 years old, and I, I was cured of cancer, and I thank God for that. Yeah. And so we talked a little bit, and she, she was such a sweet lady. We got a letter from her, and she said, I enjoyed meeting and sharing experiences with you and your wife by the dairy case in Safeway last week. And uh, she goes on to say that about the wonderful story that Don gave her about God's little grace, how inspiring, and a little child shall lead them. I would like to feature you in my blog. And so Don gave her permission, and I'm not going to read all her letter, but that's what she said. And then on her blog, this is how she started it out. She said, Dr. Seuss's first, very first book for children makes Mulberry Street the most interesting location in town. Who wouldn't cheer when an elephant pulled sleigh races by? There was no horse and broken down wagon, no zebra or elephant pulled sleigh in front of the dairy case at my local Safeway a few weeks ago. Just a tall, tanned, tanned but youthful man standing at my, smiling at me from beside an attractive woman. I had seen him before, but where? My gaze traveled to the brilliant colored vest with big letters, walking for cancer. I couldn't help saying what a wonderful thing. Thank you. I am 83 years old. God has brought me through cancer, surgery, and treatment to successfully. My medical personnel call me their miracle patient. The smile spread. Thank God he went on to share how God worked through personnel at Fred Hutchinson and Children's Hospital to heal his great-grandson, Cash Lawrence. Diagnosed with kidney cancer at 18 months. <laughs> but he is now healed of his cancer, of course. And uh, uh, anyways, she tells more about how, some of the things he's done and everything. I'm not going to read all that. You know all about those, too. 
um, said what a life he has led, a two-pound preemie, a new drowning in a lake as a boy, a high school dropout, a Marine who graduated as the head of his class, finishing high school and, and training for, mis- the, for the ministry at God's Bible School and Missionary Training School in Cincinnati, Ohio. Years as a pastor, a volunteer fire fa- fireman, and EMT. 28 years with Dirigo, and then retirement in 1994 to devote time to writing. A journey a thousand miles begins with a single step. That's her quote here. She says, 1997, well, I'm not going to tell about all these walks because you know all about that. She wanted to send us a few of the blogs that somebody had uh, given her. She put, like the U.S. Postal Service weather, even the sun, surprise snow in Auburn a few weeks ago didn't stop Don Stevenson from walking to help stomp out cancer. It's got a picture of him in the snow here. <laughs> He said he continues to serve God through serving others. And said, God willing, this won't be his last walk as long as his health holds. You ready to preach or something? Or <laughs> you got more paper than I got. No, anyways, I, I didn't bring it up here, I guess. But anyway, she, a couple of people had told how inspired they were by that. But I thought, you know, she said we inspired her, but she inspired us too. You know, it goes both ways. And lots of times when we used to go visit people in the hospital and nursing homes and stuff, and we'd have prayer with them and sing to them, and they say we were an inspiration to them, but yet it inspired us to be there from, to get that inspiration from them. And I just thank God that it's, it works both ways. <laughs> Whatever you do for him, he does it right back to you. <laughs> well, actually, you know, that's a spiritual principle that we don't often talk about. You give and you get. That's right. We don't give to get, but when we give Jesus... We get so many blessings and so many powerful moves of the Spirit in our lives. But what happens in the church is we, somewhere along the line, we quit giving, right? And we, we've forgotten that principle. But the principle is God saved us and redeemed us and filled us so that we could be a light in the darkness. And so we sometimes think we have to give a three-point message, but the truth is we just give Jesus. Okay. Now, like I told my men group, they won't confess this to you, but I have a hard time sometimes being like Jesus. I know you don't, but I do. And I said, I need prayer for God to give me the power through the Holy Spirit to be like Jesus, even when I don't want to be. It's too much work sometimes in my fleshly mind, and God has to overcome the carnality of my heart and fill me with His Spirit. But that's the kingdom principle. You want to get, give. What do you want to get? Not finances. That's fine. God does many of that. But you want to get the presence of Almighty God, you got to give what you got. You got to shine the light. You can't put it on the bushel. Amen? Amen. Great story. Hallelujah. 90%. He can do 10. His grandson was healed. We thank God for that. Amen? Anybody else? We're going to go. Yes. I got to tell on my wife. <laughs> you know, I just want to encourage everybody. If you get up in the morning and you say, Jesus... I'm yours. 100% I'm yours. Now would you take me today and do with me what you want to do with me? That's what this life is all about because it's about him being Lord, right? So we're we're cleaning the house that we're getting ready to sell, my business partner and I. And uh, so this lady drives up and she asks, are there any more of these available? I said, well, Brian's going to be building another one for someone else, but... I said, would you like to look at the house? And she says, yeah, that would be great. So Ricky took her in the house, and they went through the house. And during the time that they were going through the house, the lady confessed to Ricky that she was going through a divorce. And her heart was broken. You know, and for those of us who are grandparents, can you imagine your grandchild saying they hate you? I can't imagine that. That would break my heart. That would, that would put me down to the lowest low that I know. It really would. But anyway, this lady says her heart was broken because of this thing that was going on with her divorce. So I'm busy cleaning. And you know, guys, how they do what they do, right? They just kind of, they're on a mission. We're on a mission. We're, we've got to get this done. We've got to do this, right? Well, sometimes we need to slow down and let God take control, right? 
And that's what this is about. That's what Jesus being Lord is about, right? Jesus having control of our lives. So she starts taking off, and so I see Ricky go. Or I, 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 I see Ricky go down there, and here she is praying with her. And I just want to encourage you that if you get up in the morning and you say, God, I'm yours, 100%, that's everything of me belongs to him. Would you take me and spend me today? Spend me. Spend me. Exhaust everything in me that is of you. And I know that if you spend me, you'll fill me back up again. I know it. So just take me and use me today, Lord. And I know that Ricky does that. She is one of the most faithful people that I know. So she's praying with the lady. And the lady was touched. <laughs> Another thing, guys, I want to tell you something. Nobody knows you better than the one that, you're, that you said I do too. All right? Sometimes guys just need to listen. When my wife, it's like when E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens, right? Well, I want to tell you that when my wife speaks, I listen because she knows me better than anybody. So anyway, just, I just want to encourage you that if, if you get up in the morning and you say, God, spend me, I'm yours 100%, He'll bring people to you. He will. And they'll, they'll, for some reason, it'll come out of their mouths that they're struggling with something. And it's God, you know, no, you're His servant, you're there. It's God drawing it out of them so that you can pour out of you. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Wow. Yeah. They're out there. They're out there waiting. They're just in hold pattern until someone... That the Lord brings someone by. This is pretty interesting. I like this. I was talking to a young girl at work. Um, we started talking about drug addiction because everybody knows my son is a drug addict. And so um, it's hard to talk about it sometimes. So sometimes if you open up to somebody, they'll open up to you. So I was talking to this young girl, and so she was, she was so closed mouth and stuff, and so she just started talking to me. And she said, yeah, well, I'm a widow, and I wish I had some support. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she said, my husband died last year, April 5th, of a drug overdose. Mm, wow. And um, she says, and the only thing that kept me going was God. And she said, I will pray for you. So it was just really nice to be able to talk to her, and uh, she, you know, she opened up to me. And then another thing, I went to Sprint store the other day to uh, get my son Jeremy's phone fixed, and I have no idea why, how we started talking, but I met this other girl named Keisha. She fixed my son's phone, and um, we started talking about drug addiction again. And she says, "My son is a drug addict," and she goes, "I would really like to get together with you." And so we made a date to get together because she said, you know, I feel like I'm alone in this. I said, you're not alone. There's a lot of people out there. So I have another friend, and I'm hoping that when I talk to her, I can get her to come to church, and maybe she, you know, she can get some help right here. Well, maybe we could start a support group here. How about that? Where we can come and talk about our issues and our family and our addictions and, and just be able to pray over them and not have all the answers, right? Uh, by the way, just a little spiritual insight. He is in recovery. Can we say amen? amen. Now we, when we say that, we, we, you know, when we use the word recovery, we, some of you will conjecture up this perfect being. <laughs> well, recovery is not perfect. Can all of those who are still in recovery say amen? I'm saying, recovery comes. From the Holy Spirit. We know that, right? And one of the things that's happened in my life is God is speaking to me about me expecting things to look different than what they do and, and let Him have His way because it's not going to be what I think. It's going to be what He wants, right? That's sometimes tough to do as a control freak. But, but I'm learning to let go of that, by the way. What? And when He wants. And when he wants. <laughs> that's the problem, right? I want... Yeah, I was at McDonald's the other day, right? Twice. 
And uh, not for me, but for my granddaughter. And that crazy place is so packed, I couldn't believe it. I actually had to wait ten minutes to get my meal. I wanted it now. I almost pulled out. In fact, the second time I went there and it was a big wait, I said, ah, I can't do this, man. I'm going to go inside. And I waited 20 minutes. Right? It's kind of like me when I'm in a traffic jam. I, I decide to get over in the lane, and the lane, that thing's going fast. When I get over in the lane, guess what it does? It stops and the other two lanes move. It's like the Lord said, just stay here, relax. You'll get there when I get you there, man. It's kind of like spiritual walk. Amen. Hallelujah, Father, we come into Your presence this morning and we pray as the breaking of the bread of life would go forth that Your power and might would strengthen us and take our weak knees and make them strong. Father, we confess to You that we are sinners saved by grace. Hallelujah. And that it's not about us, it's about You. Thank You, Jesus, for all that You're doing. Thank You, Father God, that You've left us in this world. Thank You, Father God, that we have an opportunity, Father, to minister the grace of Jesus, Father. We ask You in Jesus' name to be with us now. Hallelujah. Amen. Maybe No, stay standing. Stand up with me for the honor of the reading of the Word of God. The children are dismissed. And Jay, I put your curriculum on your folder, okay? Amen. We're going to read in chapter 4 of the Gospel of Luke, and this is the temptation of Jesus, right? So fittingly so this week, uh, Luke chapter 4, uh, beginning with uh, verse 1, I think 1 through 13 is what we're going to be reading. And so we're just going to thank the Lord for that. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Quickly, just one lesson, go back to that. That word led... That word led, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. It would probably be better translated as driven. See the difference? Led and driven. Um, And I want you to, the Greek really there is an aorist tense that we are, Jesus is consistently being driven by the Holy Spirit to do what He does, okay? And this is no difference in this particular situation. The Holy Spirit, after His baptism with the Spirit of God, descended on Jesus and He said, This is My Son in whom I'm well pleased. Right? This is the one that John said, I'm not worthy to even fasten the straps on His boots. I'm not even worthy. In fact, He didn't want to baptize Him. Jesus said, No. My Father's command and My Father's will, My Father's word, My Father's prophecy must be fulfilled. Amen. So... Being tempted for 40 days by the devil, and in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when he had ended, he was... Yeah. Don't take me 40 days. And the devil said to him, the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answers him, and this is Deuteronomy, saying, It is written... Man shall not live by bread alone, but by the ver- every word of God. Woo! The bread of life. The bread of life is speaking this. This is Jesus. He is the bread of life. And He's speaking this with the Word of God against the enemy of God and His people. But Jesus answered Him saying, go back to that just quickly. Sorry, I want to make sure we get through that. But Jesus answered him saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Amen. Praise God. Then the devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Okay, here's the deal. There's two things with this thought. Just getting a little preliminary stuff done here. Here's the deal. If the Satan is talking about the kingdom of Jerusalem, the holy city, which is kind of what this is, then it's quite possible that they were on a mountain that they could overlook and see all of Jerusalem. And at that time, it was the center of what civilization historians call the hub of civilization. And so it's quite possible, even though it's a vision and a revelation and Jesus is standing there with Satan, it's quite possible that they were on a mountain where they could overlook Jerusalem and, and the devil is saying to him, all the kingdoms of this world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you in their glory, for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Now listen to this. i got good news for you. 
You know what's happening with Jesus right here? Satan doesn't know that he's the Son of God yet. In fact, what Satan is really doing, he's testing Jesus to find out if he's the Son of God. Think about that for a moment. I give this all to you. In a twinkling of an eye, I'll give this to you. Wow. I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship me before me, and it will be yours. If you will worship me, bow down to me, humble yourself in this moment of time, whatever it was, if God's Son would say, I want that, and I will worship you. Think about the end results, right? And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and Him only, and you shall serve. Serve who? God. Stop serving the devil. Stop serving sin. Stop serving the addiction. Stop serving your attitude. Stop serving whether you feel good or not. Start serving the kingdom of God. Start bowing down before Him and worship Him and magnify His name. Okay, next text. I'm ready to preach. Then He brought Him to Jerusalem, set Him on the pinnacle of temple and said to Him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. (laughs) For it is written... He shall give His angels charge over thee to keep you. It gets even better. Listen, this is a picture of a nurse leading a baby. Baby's learning to walk. Your baby's learning to walk, Randy. Right? And, you know, you you kind of go with her, and when you see something that's going to make her fall, you kind of lift her up. Right? This is exactly what this text means when God wrote it. That he will take care of his children. He will handle them like a nurse. And Satan is misquoting it. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Here we go. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Amen. Verse 13. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed. From him until an opportune time, he may be seated. Blessing to the reading of your word, Lord. Listen, Luke is the only one who puts in the end of this text, the devil left him until an opportune time. And Luke has this temptation out of sync with Matthew. Okay? It's, he has number two is number three. In Matthew, number three is number two, okay? But it doesn't matter. The temptation is there, right? Here's the interesting thing about this story. Can you think of anybody in the Old Testament that fasted for 40 days? Moses. And who? Two times. And who was Moses? Leader of the people. He... God used Moses to speak the Old Covenant into play and brought the law, he, the Ten Commandments. God used Moses to speak. And Moses fasted for 40 days twice. Somebody else in the Old Testament fasted for 40 days. Elijah. And Elijah was the prince of prophets. I mean, he was one of the most highest... In, pro- in fact, Elijah walked with God and what happened to him? He's gone. God took him, man. Never died. Now, so here we have Jesus. Just got baptized by John the Baptist, who people said he was crazy. John the Baptist, that is, right? You know, he's crazy. He doesn't come into the city. He eats what? Locusts and honey. His hair is crazy. Probably has a couple uh, dreadlocks in there. Uh, you know, I mean, he, he has the good Hawaiian shirt on him. I mean, this guy had camel hair clothes. I mean, this guy would be probably what we would call a hippie. And he ate naturally. He was, he was organic before organic was real. Right? But, but they said he was crazy. And Jesus comes and it's fulfilled, right? You know, there are two types of people in the world. Those who love the wilderness, who like to go camping, sleeping on the ground. And those who hunt and fish and... Those who don't, who prefer uh, a Hilton. I don't know which one you are. Uh, 
So if you prefer the Hilton, it's going to be a little difficult for you to know that Jesus was driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness where he didn't have air mattresses. Okay? And he didn't have Burgervilles on the corner. Uh, Burgerville, you don't know what that is. Burger King. Burgerville's from my old days. Right? But he'd seen this in an opportunity. Why did God drive Jesus into the wilderness? Because the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. Why? Beautiful example. Can you talk to me about any other wilderness journey in the Old Testament? Who went on into the wilderness? Children of Israel. This is, not, this is, this is just a Bible quiz. The first wilderness trip was out of Egypt. God was delivering him from enslavement. You got that? And a matter of fact, how long were they in Egypt? 400 years. In fact, it was, they were enslaved for so long that they didn't think they were ever going to get out. And Moses shows up on the scene and says, I am sent me. And we're going to get out of here. You're crazy. They wanted to believe, but they had been in enslavement for so long, they were really struggling with believing. That's a fact. You can read it. Who are you? You're going to... You know, you're going to kill us like you killed the... Uh, yeah, so you know the story that drove uh, Moses to the wilderness. And Moses went to the wilderness, by the way. And what happened in the wilderness with Moses the first time? He found God. Exactly. Lowly shepherd found God. So wilderness represents spiritually a place where we can find God. Wilderness then represents to us in the church in modern day era that wilderness is an opportunity and adventure for us to come closer to the living God and to see the provision that God has for us. That's the spiritual intent. But did you know there was a second journey that Israel went into the wilderness? Do you remember what that was? When God sent the twelve spies into the promised land... And ten of them came back and said, there is no way we can take that promised land. There is no way those people are too huge. They're, you know, and, and by the way, why they're saying that, they're packing on a, a, st- a peg between two of them a cluster of grapes that they couldn't pack alone. Oh, they did say that this land was full of honey and full of fruit and there was great stuff there, but the people are too many and too big and, we- and too strong and we cannot defeat them. You remember that story? This has, this is pertaining to Jesus' wilderness trip here, folks. It really is a spiritual mind that we need to understand about Jesus' wilderness trip. So who stood up against the ten? Joshua and Caleb. Hey! If God sent us there, God will deliver the land unto us. Amen! Two out of twelve. Hey, where do you find yourself in the twelve today? Are you Joshua and Caleb? Are you saying whatever God calls us to, He will do? Are you part of the ten that says we can't do that because it's too hard? We can't see a change in Washington, D.C. We can't see a change in our neighbor. We can't go out there because the enemy has taken over. In fact, it's he's so prominent, we've got to hide in our house. And... Think about that just for a moment. Does it have... You bet you it does. So, God said to Israelite, how long do I have to put up with this stubborn, rebellious people? How long? By the way, because of your murmuring against me and your unbelief, you're not going into the promised land right now. I'm sending you into the wilderness. For how many days? Forty years. I'm sending you into the wilderness, into the desert, for forty years until everyone who spoke that murmuring is gone. Then those, your children who are left, will retake the promised land. So the Israelites said, okay. Cool. We believe you. 
Why? Because some pestilence fell on the ten who murmured, right? They could see that God was not happy. So they said, okay, we made a mistake. Uh, We're going to take the land. So they go to Moses and said, we're going to take the land. And, And Moses says, no, you're not going to take the land. God will not be with you. If you go and you do that, you'll be routed. A military term used routed means that the enemy will have his way with you. Okay? So lots of times in temptation when we fail or we murmur against God, what happens to us in the spiritual world, the enemy routes us. That's why it's important. I heard you guys talking about temptation in your class today. That's why it's important that Jesus went into the wilderness because He's now bringing a new covenant. He's now bringing a new law. He's now opening the door for the law of grace. The law of mercy. What did Satan do to him? Satan said to him, Hey man, you know what? Forty days you fasted, you're hungry. Now the Word of God in Luke says that he was being tempted throughout the whole forty days. I happen to think that when you are at the end of those forty days and you're very hungry, I don't know about you, but when I get hungry, I am cranky and irritable. Satan comes in an opportune time when Satan knows that Jesus Christ is the hungriest. And he knows because he knows human nature, and Jesus was, what? God-man. So he waits till that time when Jesus is the hungriest, and he tempts him, and he says what? He says, Jesus was hungry, man. Now, when I did some research on this text, one of the interesting things I found is that the, the stones that Satan was quoting, you know, turn the stone into bread, that the stones were called a certain name and they actually looked like a loaf of bread. They were called, I forget the first name, I think it was Joseph Gems, I think is what they called it. I'm not sure. But here's the deal. You hungry? Man, hey, take things into your own control. You just take over. How many of you? When you're tempted, you try to take over on your own strength. You try to defeat the enemy's schemes on your own strength. That's what Satan was doing to Jesus, man. Hey, you have, if you are who you say you are, then turn the rocks into bread. Turn the stones into bread. That wasn't God's plan, was it? That wasn't what the Father wanted. The Spirit drove him into the wilderness. He is the center of the Spirit. He is the Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. They all dwell together. They were in the wilderness with Jesus. And what did Jesus say? Man does not live by bread alone. Can we say amen? But by every word from God. Well, let me ask you a question. Preaching point. Is that how you live in? church, pastor, do you understand that the Word of God and hiding it and meditating on it and remembering it and memorizing it is one of the most important things we could do? Amen. Thank you. Makes me want to preach when you say amen, so if you want me to stop preaching, don't say it. Wow. (laughs) It worked good, did it? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus said to him, it is written, no, we're not done, so listen. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And then the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you in the glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Now, this is an interesting text. This, I don't know how to break this down, but Satan has just told the living God, the Son of the living God, the Savior of the world, that all of the earthly kingdoms have been given to Him. And He has the authority to give it to whomever He wants. Let me ask you a question. Are you seeking after worldly possessions? Or are you seeking after the kingdom of God? 
Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. See, Satan wanted Jesus to fall for the trap that all these earthly things that he was in kingdoms, he wanted Satan, Satan wanted Jesus to say, I want all that pride and ego and power. You ever get tired of the politicians who act like they have all the power in the world? Right? Now, I know you're not going to say this, but do you ever get tired of people in the congregation who sit on boards who think they have all the power of the kingdom of God and the, and the others have nothing? I know you wouldn't say amen to that. But it happens in the church, guys. And what Jesus is saying, no way. Absolutely not. We already know that He has the Word of God in Him. He said, but it is written, we shall worship God alone. We shall worship God alone. We should not let any material things, we should not let any power corrupt us. We should be corrupted by the power of the Holy Spirit, corrupted to become like Jesus, to overcome the flesh and to overcome the carnality, to surrender our lives to Jesus, to make a difference in this world. There is a power structure in this world. There is a power structure. And many, many people Bow to the world and its power. There's a text in the sower of the seed. I love it. Because it said the seed fell on sort of good ground, but the weeds came and choked it out. And then when you do the research, and Jesus said when the apostles were there and the disciples were there and nobody understood it because he was speaking in parables, and they asked him and Jesus explained to him that this, this, the seed fell on good ground. It could have grown. It could have produced. But the weeds represent the care of this world. And it choked out the life of Christ. I've been dealing with this in my life. Have I allowed the cares of this world to choke out the life that Christ has for me? That is not to say we don't have anything in the world. That isn't to say we don't have houses and lands. And No, but it's to say they're not our primary. Our primary goal is to reach the life of Christ in us. To strive to become like Him. And the only way we can strive to become like Him is to be overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit. I said overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit and takes the carnal heart and drives us to our knees so that we begin to worship the living God. And all that we want is not power that's on this side of heaven, but we want His power, not strange power, but His power to work in our lives. Preach it, brother! I'll say it to myself. The wilderness then is an experience that we can actually go through and have victory. There is a purpose for wilderness. God is teaching us to become like Him. And He's teaching us how to stand against temptation and to stand with His victory. It's a beautiful example of the new covenant. See, in the old, there was no victory. The Bible says all men have fallen short of the glory of God. All men have sinned and the wages of sin is death. And all men deserve death. But the New Testament is all whosoever shall believeth on the Son of the living God, Jesus Christ, shall have eternal life. And it's appointed on the man to die once, but not the second death. We shall live forever. Did you know when you came out of your mama's womb? Did you know before you were even coming out of the womb that God had already laid a plan for you? Did you know that, that in that plan and in that seed and in that womb that you will live for eternity whether you're serving God or not? Now there's some notion theologically who say there is no hell. And that when death comes you just evaporate and there's nothing to you. It's not what the Word of God teaches. But I'm saying to you we are created to be eternal beings. We are who we are. The Bible says that we're made in the image of God. We will spend eternity with Jesus or without Jesus. And I'm not preaching this gospel to shake you down. I'm preaching the truth. We get to decide whether we will confess our sins and ask Jesus Christ to be our Lord and spend eternity with Him. Hallelujah! Here's the thing. I didn't find Him. He found me. Here's even the greater theory. I didn't go looking for Him. He came looking for me. Woo! That's who Jesus is. He doesn't leave us lost. The whole purpose of this process in the wilderness is that Jesus shows a different dynamic of the new covenant. 
Jesus is showing to you and I, those who will surrender and submit to Christ, there is victory in Jesus. Victory in Jesus. In spite of what the enemy is telling you. In spite of what your mind is even saying. There is victory in Jesus. That's just flat good theology. Victory in Jesus. Well, I don't feel like I got victory. It don't matter. You got victory. Let the eye believe it. As Glenn said earlier, believe it. Speak it. That doesn't mean we're not going to go through tragedy and struggles. In fact, the Bible says we are. Jesus said, hey, what do you got to look forward to? Hating me? They're going to hate you too. In fact, Jesus even said in the end times, they're going to bring you before the synagogues, before kings and priests, and before the law and before whomever and dictators. And he said, they're going to bring you, they're going to want to kill you, they hate you. But don't worry. Yes, be of good cheer, because I will give you the words to speak. Amen. Think about that. Some of you who've never had an experience of an anointing of the Holy Spirit, on that day, if you are a true follower of Jesus Christ, you may experience the first opportunity you ever had to be anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit, because you are a mouthpiece unto the darkened world even then. Someone said once to me, have you ever noticed how Christians die? They die so differently than someone who doesn't know Jesus. The last temptation. The devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world. This has been delivered to me. <sighs> Again, we're stuck here. Really? I thought, I thought God was in control. Now, He's given some authority to a spiritual principle. When you turn from God and you allow Satan to have his way in your life, there's some of it happening in your life. And Satan doesn't just want a little bit of you. He wants all of you. Now let me say something to you. Isn't that interesting? Satan is hard-pressed to steal everything that's of good in you. He hates us. By the way, he hates all humans. All of God's creation. Whether you serve in him or not, he hates you anyway. Satan is not capable of mercy and love. It's just not. He lost all that ability when he turned his back on God and he was pushed out of heaven and fallen. But, here he's offering everything that he can to Jesus, right? Hey, and not only does he do that, don't worry about it, man, because... You know, you can jump off this and God's going to send His angels to protect you. Don't be stupid. God will still love you and show mercy and grace, but if you make a decision to do something God tells you not to, He will cover you with grace, but that also will, you will reap some of what you sow. Can we say amen? Yeah. Will you be destroyed? Will there be condemnation? No. No. But you will reap what you sow because God wants to teach you that you have victory in Jesus, but you have to take it. You have to resist temptation. What does the Bible say? Resist what? The devil. And he will what? Beautiful picture. This is a beautiful scriptural picture of the wilderness journey and the temptation of Jesus. What did he do? He resisted him through the Word of God. He used the Word of God, which is more powerful than a double-edged sword that cuts through all marrow. And He used the Word of God. He's the Son of God. He's the living Word. He's the written Word. And He used the Word to do the battle. Amen. And the thing about it is, the beautiful part about all this is, He resisted Him and it says that the devil left Him. Until an opportune time, Luke said. Until that right moment, emotionally, discouragement, overwhelmness, cares of this world, choking a Beautiful picture. Beware, when you are struggling is when the enemy loves to pounce. Amen. Let me tell you, church, spiritual principle number three today. When you are in that shape, are you hearing me? What you need is to find a brother or sister that you can go to and say, I'm, I'm really battling. I really need you to pray with me. I really need you to help me. I really need you to come alongside of me. And I just need you to be there. Hallelujah! That's the church! Jesus said, no, 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 no. 
I'm not going to do that because the Word of God says this. It has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. i got to be honest with you, friends. I had a story of a friend that used to be my pastor's son before I was a minister. And he used to be in so many things. I'm not even going to go into all the stuff he's into. And he, So I was talking to him once and he said to me, he said, Ah, don't worry, Steve. He said, I'm doing all this so I can have a great testimony that God can use. Deception. Deception. I will give you all this. Hey, I tell you what, go ahead and jump off this. And God said, no, do not tempt the Lord thy God. Do not be foolish. You have no authority or power when you're weakened by the devil. Do you understand what I'm saying? God will not bring evil into your life so that he can have a testimony. God doesn't need your testimony. Can we say amen? Amen. He doesn't need it. He doesn't need me to defend Him. He doesn't need me to tell there is a God. He is God. My friend, you've heard it if you've been here long enough, my friend was raised in a Christian church and so he's running around with his neighbors and he lived over in Tillamook, Oregon and his dad had a farm and so he ran around with neighbor kids and this neighbor kid did something to him once and he said he was really angry at him so he knew he couldn't cuss because he knew he wasn't supposed to cuss. So he gave the neighbor kid $5 to cuss the other kid out. True story. He's thinking, ah, I paid the guy to cuss him out. It's not on me. The blood's not on my hands. I'm still good. I'm in right standing with my pops. I'm in right standing with my religion. I'm in right falsehood. But, but when some of us began to get saved and God was moving mightily in our local church and we were going fast and leaps and bounds, one of the things we would have was a testimony service, and we would share our testimonies. And one day, he came up to us afterwards, and he said to me and my friends, and he said, I wish I had a testimony like you. I wish my testimony was as great as yours. I said, oh, brother, don't you ever say that. Don't you ever say that. Your testimony is so far greater than mine. Amen. God kept you safe and out of the trouble that I had to fight. That's the testimony of God. God is faithful and never let you wander. And you never wandered. That's a far greater testimony than those of us who wandered away from the grace of God and got trapped with the devil's schemes. And because God brought us back to Him be the glory, not to us. It's not about our testimony. It's about His testimony. And God kept you safe while we were lost. That's power. That's power. Right? Okay. Man, I don't know. I was thinking we'd get out of here early today. So Jesus was driven into the wilderness. Forty days. Hungry. Tempted by every sphere of humanly possible in that power, material things, and worship. The three things that the enemy loves to use to get our sights off of Jesus. Those of you who are dieting, praise God. But if you don't focus on Jesus, the diet won't work. There's got to be a reason why you want to lose weight. And Jesus has to motivate you to lose weight. Can we say amen? We used to do a thing called way down. Everybody remember that? Do you remember what she used to say? God makes a way of escape. It's like when you go to order McDonald's and you order something you're not supposed to do and all of a sudden you get the bag and the bag falls out of the window as you're picking up in the drive-thru and it all spills on the ground. <laughs> remember that? And she said, that's a way out. <laughs> God just did a way out. Don't drive back through the drive-thru and get more. Amen? The ideal that is everything we do, we are centered on Christ. I heard someone say, can fat people make it into heaven? Be careful how you speak that. Cause, uh, no, it, you don't get to heaven because of how you look or how you are, by your weight or your size or your height or how about good you are. You get to heaven by grace yeah. and mercy and compassion. He paid the price for you and I. Now, friend, if you lose a little weight with the help of Jesus, Steve... 
You might live a little longer. You might be able to present the gospel a little more. And I said to him one day when he said that to me, through the Holy Spirit, I said, I don't want to live longer. What do you think Jesus said? Oh, faithful servant. <laughs> no. He said, that's not your business. My business is you. And you are to do what I ask you to do, and you will live longer so I can use you more often. Jesus said in the final, he left and Satan came. And and the final picture of this wilderness temptation is a beautiful picture for us. When we are being tempted sorely by the enemy, God sends his warring angels around us to give us a battle plan. And when Satan leaves, what did they do? What did they do to Jesus? You think it's just Jesus that's got angels? Now, don't worship angels. But do you think it's just Jesus that has angels? When you sorely are being tempted and you resist Satan and he flees, God sends his care. God sends his love, his mercy, his, his hugs, his... Okay. If you're here this morning and you're bound by your sins, it's okay. God has a plan. He has an answer. But in that plan, you must confess your sins. And you must ask Jesus Christ to forgive you, even if you've done it before. Christians can become embedded with bondage. But God is saying, resist Him, and He will flee from you. What are you going to do? You're going to walk out this morning and you're going to let the bondage have control and you're going to go on living like you lived? Are you going to be like Jesus and you're going to resist Him and He will flee from you? No one can make you do that. By the way, I'm not going to check off on a list that these people came up. I just want you to know Jesus is who He said He was. And he overcame, and he said, because I have overcome, you can overcome too. Do you believe that? About four of you, five of you. Some of you are so in bondage right now. And I'm telling you, you don't think it's possible. You're like the Egyptians who enslaved God's people, and for 400 years they were enslaved. And they didn't think they were ever getting out. Even when God sent a man who he sent purposely for them, they would not believe it. You think God just sent the plagues for Egyptian? Had nothing to do with Egypt. He was building faith in His people because He knew that they were weak and beaten and did not believe they could be delivered. After every plague, they were realizing that this God that sent Moses, I am, was for real. Oh, and by the way, God said... When you leave Egypt, (laughs) take their gold and their sheep and their cattle. I I wonder how Pharaoh's army rode out to get them, where they got the animals. The Israelites screwed up again. They forgot to get it all. No, just kidding. But you might be like them today. I'm going to invite you to stand with me. You don't have to come to the altar. You can if you want to. But I'm asking you to resist temptation and to flee from it, and the devil will leave you. And I'm asking you, if you're in caught in that trap today, I'm asking you to, to receive the grace of God and the cleansing power and the healing and the deliverance of Jesus, right? One of the things, secondly, for those who th- are clear of that, there's another issue that we want to talk about today. God said in the Word, Jesus was driven by the Spirit to the wilderness. Jesus was sent by the Holy Spirit into the war. But what happens in the church, we don't want a war. We just want everybody else to do it, but we don't want to take that responsibility on. But I'm going to tell you something. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you've bought by the blood of the Lamb, you are in a war whether you like it or not. Amen. Now, the factor is, the spiritual principle is, do you want to be one of those warriors who has the power of God and fights with spiritual weapons? 
Or do you want to be one of those fleshly warriors that have no power and you have a form of godliness, but yet you deny his power? That's what happened to religious osity. We have all the things down. We know what to say, but we do not have the power of the living God in us. And religion can kill us. Spiritual life sets us free. I love the story I read in my devotions. It said, God does not bring death. God brings life. But the enemy convinces us that when we give our heart and surrender to him, that he's going to take our life. No, he brings life. You don't know life till you surrender to him. So I'm going to invite those this morning who are afraid to fight the war. Now, don't get me wrong. We, we have to use the spiritual weapons. It's not about who we are and how strong we are. Everything Satan probably tells us probably could be true. But, I, but God has cleansed me and healed me. And so when you accuse me, you don't get to accuse me. You have to go to my Savior and my Lord and my God and my General and my Commander. And you tell Him that story because I'm covered by the blood. You may accuse me, but my Father in Heaven and my Savior and my Spirit, His Spirit that He gives me, does not accuse me. He convicts me. There's a difference. No condemnation to those who are found in Christ Jesus. God doesn't step on your chest because He's bringing condemnation. God steps on your chest with the heart of conviction because He loves you and He knows what's best for you. And He knows where you're going to go and He knows how to get you there and He knows what you need to do to get there. And He's teaching us that. And So I invite you to pray that prayer. God, give me the ability to do the war that You've called me to be. Where I am weak, make me strong where I have things that have chained me, set me free from that. But Father God, let me not run from the war, but let me stand in the presence of You and war with Your power and Your might. The battle has been won. It's by faith. And we've already received what we're going to get. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Father, we come in the name of Jesus this morning. You know, I know... I've been where I've preached this morning. I I confess to my brothers and my sisters that I have been in every point of this message in my life of walking with you since I was 20 years old. But I can honestly say there are those spiritual moments and principles that you apply and open my eyes to. And when I buy into that and by faith claim it and believe it, you have done the cleansing and the healing. You have empowered. Now, so those requests that we've put out as a man... If your spirit is not working, then, Father, have your way. But I happen to believe your spirit is at work, and I know that you are talking to us, Lord. And so, Father, God, I pray, pour into our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Hey, hey, give us victory, Father God, in, in a place we've never felt victory before. Oh, and by the way, as a congregation, I pray for conquer and for beyond betrayal. Father God, help us. This is, a, this is a battlefield that is destroying the church. And we have been weakened because of our enslavement to it. But you want to set us free and ignite the fire. So help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Go with us as we pray, as we leave. Amen? One statistic, forget the message. It's already planted in your heart. But let me tell you a statistic that we've never talked about. Did you know that 62% of evangelical men who will find themselves in a place that preaches Jesus, 62% of them are addicted to porn? Did you know that 54% of evangelical pastors who preach from behind the pulpit have the same addiction? Did you know that 24 to 28%, up to 32% of the women who sit in congregations of the kingdom of God are addicted to porn? And it goes to about 55% of those people who, whose life has been battered because of their loved one turning to it. If you don't think we're in a battle, you might as well jump in with us. But please pray for me and the other leadership team as we step into this place. The devil does not like it, but greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. And so I'm asking the congregation, don't take this lightly. God wants to give victory to those men and to those women who have been bound by this stuff. God wants to send them free. And sometimes it's so much bound in us that we don't want to be set free. Let me tell you something about an addict. When they get clean, you know the first thing that happens to them, they grieve their addiction. Same thing happens to a sinner. Sometimes we've walked in sin so long that when we, God does take it from us, we miss it. 
But God wants to fill that up with His presence and His power. And He wants to set us free so that we only grieve when we're not walking with the Lord. Have a good day. I promise you, they're going to get shorter. In heaven. Wait a minute. Paul preached and then the guy fell out of the window. They brought him back to life and he preached some more. And don't tell me Paul was an inspired preacher because the guy went to sleep on him. (laughs) 